Hi everyone, uh, my name is Annalise and uh, I've been invited here today to give a lecture on sustainability. Um, so a bit of background about myself. I left RHS in 2012 and I went on to study uh, archaeology at the University of Nottingham. And in 2016, I went on and left the University of Nottingham to go and study a master's uh, at the University of Edinburgh in Environmental Protection and Management. And this course really had a, a really broad focus um, on all areas of sustainability and environmental protection. And um, it really opened up my eyes to um, the state of the world and the current affairs which are happening today. And since finishing my master's, I uh, managed to get a paid internship at a company called Changeworks. And now I work for um, a company called Bureau Havard as a waste consultant. So I'll dive into that a little bit more in my lecture. And um, I just want to say thank you for inviting me here today. So. so a little bit really about how I got into the industry um, is what I'll start the presentation today with and sort of cover what I do now, then sort of touch on an introduction to sustainability, uh, followed by really the impact that human activities had on our planet over the last century. And this will then hopefully lead into sort of a nice introduction to the circular economy. And I'll explain what the circular economy is and um, give some examples of the circular economy in action. I'll then sort of start to sum summarise really with a few steps you can take to live a more sustainable lifestyle, where you can find out more. And at, at the end, there'll be some time for some questions if anybody um, has anything they'd like to ask. So as I touched on just earlier, um, a bit about, so I guess, my background. Um, I left RHS not really knowing what I wanted to study. Um, I had a really broad interest in a lot of areas and I chose to uh, focus them on archaeology. And this I studied at the University of uh, Nottingham and I absolutely loved this course, although it's not something I'd focus on now. It was such an interesting uh, course and it has covered a huge uh, sort of expanse of time, really. It explored many interesting areas from human evolution, the impact that the Greeks and Romans had on trade to sort of looking at uh, underwater, underwater archaeology and looking at sort of Viking shipwrecks and sort of shipwrecks maybe from sort of King Henry VIII there and the Mary Rose. But one thing which really stood out from studying this huge expanse of time is the impact which humans have had since their evolution on the planet, whether that's been over hunting of Ice Age animals or the movement of plants and species from native homelands to new shores, or the, even the mining of metal ores and sort of the, the beginning of the Iron, the Iron Age. Everything humans have done since the dawn of time have had, has had an impact on the planet. So two years after finishing my degree at Nottingham, I decided to enrol in the Masters at the University of Edinburgh to study this. And the course really focused on processes that give rise to environmental degradation and pollution problems, whilst providing an in-depth understanding of sort of natural ecosystems and management and strategies put in place to protect and conserve these. Topics include what included areas like resource, water resource management, land use, waste and recycling, air quality, and, and also principles of sustainability. So I guess this leads on to uh, my career path and what I've done since leaving university. And since leaving university, I've sort of stayed within the sustainability uh, field. And I started off with a paid internship at Changeworks, which was a really, a, a really great insight um, into environmental management, uh, particularly in Scotland. So Changeworks is one of Scotland's largest environmental charities, but they also own a waste um, recycling company where they collect waste from businesses across Glasgow and Edinburgh. And unlike many uh, waste companies out there, they have a real strong focus on source segregation and they want to sort of uh, capture as much resource from waste as possible before sending it to landfill. And that really opened my eyes up to the waste industry policies which are being rolled out to ensure that where possible, you know, we're avoiding sending all this waste to landfill. So following on from that, I uh, got a job at Bedware and Bedware is a compostable packaging company which makes uh, food service items like coffee cups and burger boxes from compostable materials rather than traditional plastic ones which have to be sent to landfill or to um, energy for waste plants. So these compostable products can be broken down to compost instead. And then more recently I have started my job at Bureau Happold as a waste consultant and that was at the beginning of this year. So I thought I'd just touch on what I do now um, so you get a bit of an insight of that. And there's three key areas. The first is advising on strategy for government policies. So this could be looking at uh, pl implementing plastic policies in countries. So recently I was advising policymakers in Dubai on steps that they could take to reduce their use of plastics. And this was in the form of sort of bans, levies and taxes, which they could roll out. 
Another focus is working with architects and uh, other consultants to advise on building plans. And this could be hotels, towers, uh, towers which, which hold hotels and offices, headquarters and sports sites like stadiums. Um, at the moment, I'm also working on uh, developing the, the new site for Wimbledon and looking to implement sort of state of the art recycling strategies for visitors, staff and players. And then finally, we also advise on master plans and master plans are developments of new cities and these are normally occur in the Middle East. So examples could be providing estimations on how many new waste facilities a new city is going to need when it's developed um, you know, on the, on the edge of the Red Sea in uh, Saudi Arabia. So I thought I'd really start you know, now on why I'm here today, which is to talk to you about sustainability, the circular economy and you know, sustainable lifestyle choices. So I think the first question is, what does sustainability mean? And often when people hear about the word sustainability, they think of a word in relation to acts which can be taken, for example, maybe sustainable travel or recycling or you know, supporting renewable energy uses or planting trees or maybe even eating a plant based uh, diet. And there are many definitions of sustainability out there, but perhaps one of the most well known definitions of sustainability comes from the Brundtland Commission. And this was a sub organization of the United Nations, and they aimed to unite countries in pursuit of sustainable, develop sustainable development. And they define sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So I guess what does what does this mean? Um, Essentially, it means that we fulfill the needs we, we require today, but also leave the planet in a, and resources in a state where future generations are able to meet the needs of tomorrow. And I think at this point, it's important to understand that at the moment, the human race as a whole aren't living sustainably. And the impact that humans are having on the planet means that we are affecting the ability of future generations to meet their future needs. At the moment, it's, it's quite well known that humans are consuming the world's resources faster than the, the world can supply them. The human population has increased over the last century, and it's now estimated that there are somewhere between 7.9 and 8 billion humans on the planet. And this is projected to only increase as, as time goes on, and by 2030 it's expected to increase to 8.5 billion. Today we use 1.75 planet's worth of resources and this is because we're using resources in the linear economy style of take, make, dispose. But by 2030 we're going to need two planets to fulfil the needs of all humans if we can continue to live in the style that we are today. So I guess what's the true actual impact of this? And over the last 100 years humans have ramped up their activities and as mentioned before they're using resources at, at a scale which the planet now can't keep up with. There are many activities which I, I, I could have covered today, um, but here are six key activities which I believe showcase how humans are depleting the world's resources by living unsustainably. And these are through farming, mining, fishing, the burning of fossil fuels, the production of plastics and deforestation. So I thought I'd touch on farming and um, this image shows the effects of monoculture, agriculture and poor farming techniques which have been used for centuries. So for centuries, farmers have ploughed the earth soil and constantly harvested plants from the same areas of land without really ever returning the vital nutrients needed to keep these top soils healthy. And as a result, this has led to rapid decline in soil health. And it's now estimated that in the UK, we now have, have only about 30 harvests left. And in East Anglia in particular, you know, where the school's based, the soil is in some of the worst conditions seen in the UK. And soil is not only vital for growing plants and crops for us to consume, but it plays an essential part in capturing carbon. So soil kind of acts like a carbon sink. But as healthy soil declines and as land is ploughed for farming, the carbon is then released into the atmosphere. And essentially, this carbon is also what adds to the global warming effect. So secondly, you know, here's a picture of a, a quarry. And um, not only does mining deplete the world of its natural resources, and sort of we're using up copper and lead and aluminium in a rate which we can't then uh, replenish. But it also has an, a causes an array of other environmental issues, one of which is air pollution, for example. You know, it, as uh, machinery is ploughing through this earth and quarrying away at the rocks, it's, release, it's releasing ore dust and gases, which are bad for the health of the miners as well as the local environment. 
water pollution is it, it is a big key issue which is left over by the mining process and this can really make and it can make its way into local water systems leading to an increased acidity and heavy metal contaminations in these local water supplies and this not only destroys wildlife but it can also have a really significant impact on local communities often which are local poor communities and you know this isn't really often declared but they can have a devastating impact on on these people and it can lead to all sorts of issues and health complications and problems with fertility as well and finally as you can imagine as you can see here uh it's kind of cut away into the earth and it's and it's led to habitat damage and it's destroyed the you know the homes of local wildlife Fishing is one which um, is a topic which I think people are becoming more and more clued up, clued up about and aware of. And uh, over the past century, you know, we've had these amazing technological advances, but it's meant that humans have been able to significantly deplete the world's fish stocks. Around 90% of the world's large fish, fish have, now been over, have now been wiped out by overfishing. And it's estimated that each year 2.7 trillion fish are taken out of the ocean. It's expected by 2048 that the oceans will virtually be empty of any fish. And, you know, this not only has an issue that causes an, the issue of not having fish in the ocean, this has knock on effects. One of which, for example, is the byproduct of the fishing industry, which is all the plastic waste which is pr produced to capture these fish. 70% of macroplastics found in the sea, they reckon, come from fishing gear. And along Along with this, if you think about the big trawlers that go out there, like with nets like these, are huge trawling nets which are larger than you know football pitches, and these then, as they trawl up the fish on the bottom of the surface, they also uh, churn up the earth and the, well the, the sediment underneath, and that releases gases, and unfortunately these gases can then also you know add add to uh, the carbon uh, carbon in the atmosphere, which adds to global warming. Key issue, which I think everyone's aware of, is the burning of fossil fuels, and this is coal, gas and oil. And this has had a significant impact on the planet. You know, burning fossil fuels has, has led us to where we are today, which is fantastic. But unfortunately, byproducts of this means that they're releasing CO2 along with other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And these gases are really harmful to, the, to humans as, as well as the general planet. They warm the planet as they get trapped in the atmosphere. And it, this, this warming of the Earth leads to climate change. The, the burning fossil fuels account for three quarters of all carbon emissions that are released into the atmosphere each year. So if we can start to move away from fossil fuels, we can help re reduce that level of carbon. And the, mission, the emissions that are produced are also very harmful to the health of humans. You know, they, they can have knock on effects on uh, fer fertility issues, but also um, respiratory issues as well. And that comes from not only the burning of fossil fuels in plants like this, but burning fossil fuels through vehicles. And this results in the buildup of uh, smog in cities like China as well. So I think a topic, another topic, which thankfully, uh, you know, the public are being made aware of, and there's not normally a day that goes by without a piece of press about plastic pollution. But the rate that humans have uh, been producing and using plastic has, ha has significantly increased even just over the last 10 years. And all the plastic ever produced today, ever produced up until this point, has only been produced since 1950. So if you think that since the 1950s, all plastic that you see today, that's when it started being produced, which I think is quite shocking. And in that time, they reckon it's 8.3 trillion tons of plastic, has, oh, trillion tons of plastic has been produced. And this plastic, nearly all of it's still here, even if it's recycled. Most of the plastic still is, is on land or in the oceans, unfortunately. And this has had a, a really detrimental effect on not only ocean environments, but terrestrial environments and human health. So 8 million tonnes of plastic, they re reckon, enters the ocean every single year. And they reckon that plastics make up about 95% of litter found in the marine environment. And marine wildlife is affected by this pollution. And that could be through ingestion, like consuming plastic or entangling or chemical contamination from when it uh, breaks down in, in their bodies. Plastic littered on land is often, an, I think, a a subject which is missed in, in, in the news, but this can cause flooding by blocking waterways and death of wildlife by consuming it. And recent studies suggest there's more macroplastics in the soil that could that, that, than are in the marine environment. And these mac macroplastics not only have harm on organisms in living in the soil through bioaccumulation, but they can work their way up the food chain, affecting livestock and ultimately affecting ourselves. And I think finally, it's worth mentioning that the impact of plastics, um, the, the impacts plastics have on human health. 
And this is an area which is, is still really being studied and there's not so much research out there. But the research which is out there is unfortunately that this has a negative impact on human health. And this is whether it's burned to incineration facilities or uh, illegal sites, you know, plastics release greenhouse gases and other additives when they're burned. And these, once they're released into the atmosphere, you know, we breathe those in and they're known to have negative effects on the respiratory, reproductive, neurological systems in humans. And unfortunately, as you know, as as you might be aware, these can migrate on land and in the sea and can migrate the way up food chains as well. So we can be consuming plastic and they reckon that most uh, fish which is caught in Britain and which we consume now contains microplastics. And finally, that you know, you know, the slide on deforestation um, is one of the key impacts which humans are having on the planet. And I'm sure this is a topic which lots of you are aware of. I think this was one of the first topics which was really raised by the UN. And humans have been cutting down forests at an alarming rate over the past century. Most experts agree that we're losing upwards of 80,000 acres of tropical rainforest every single day. And, you know, so what's the issue this is causing? Well, it's biodiversity loss, but not only that, we need trees for, for other reasons, not least which is the one which they're able to absorb the carbon dioxide which we exhale. And they and these also help trap greenhouse gases which humans' activities emit. So by chopping down the rainforest for your new furniture or for burning of the wood is causing a significant impact on the, on the planet. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one which we've been struggling to, to really uh, get a grip on over the last century. So one key impact which all of these activities have, which I just mentioned, is causing a rise in sort of average global temperature. And uh, the IPCC, which stands for the Intergovernmental Planet on Climate Change, is a body of the United Nations responsible for advancing knowledge on human induced climate change. And since the 1990s, they've released six assessment reports and each of these document the impact which humans are having, the, the impact of human activities. This slide shows a graph with the ice hockey, the well, the hockey stick uh, graph is, is commonly known as, and this is from the 2021 report. So it's a little bit old now, but I think it really gives a, a good understanding of how human activities have impacted global climate. And it's sort of shown that over the past, you know, 1000 years, the average global temperature in the blue, and for the first 900, uh, sorry, across the whole graph, but in the first 900 years, which isn't really in the blue at the lower part of the graph, you know, there has been little variation in, in the average temperature. But then in the 20th century, there comes a sharp rise in temperature. And this rise in temperature coincides with advances like the Industrial Revolution. And unfortunately, it indicates that burning of fossil fuels and uh, many other activities have had a big impact on average global temperature. And some people might think this is great, you know, we're going to have nice hot summers and we're going to be, uh, you know, being able to sunbathe in the UK. Well, unfortunately, you know, as in the UK, we might not be the first to be negatively affected by this. We're already seeing the impact which this is having across the globe, whether it's the melting of the ice caps, whether it's uh, an increase in flooding. It could be an increase in the uh, number and both the length of droughts and also, uh, you know, as, as often as is as often as it, is, as it is in the news, there's been an increase in wildfires and all of these are caused by an average global temperature rise. Unfortunately, it means that headlines such as these will only become more commonplace. So I guess how do we avo avoid this and uh, how can we change and alter the impact which humans are having on the planet? Well, one way to do this would be living a more in a more sustainable way through implementing uh, a circular economy. So I think a circular economy is seen as probably one of the most desirable options to achieving a more sustainable life. The circular economy is an economy in which waste doesn't exist. To make it easy to understand, I think that the, the easiest way to understand it is to think of a tree. The tree takes nutrients from the ground and it grows leaves and fruits and these feed animals and ourselves. The tree converts CO2 to oxygen and in autumn the leaves fall off the tree and these leaves provide nutrients for other organisms. And in this cycle, nothing is wasted and nothing is waste. But this tree is only a small example. Our economy is globalised. So how do we as humans work towards a circular economy? Some of you might recognise this diagram. This is the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation butterfly diagram. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation was set up by the retired sailboat uh, racer, Dame Ellen MacArthur, and they really promote the circular economy. 
they produced this diagram to help explain how we could live in a more cir circular economy lifestyle and uh, way of life. So the diagram, um, it shows the continuous flows of technical cycles and uh, biological materials through their value circles. The left side, uh, the green side, uh, this shows the natural cycle of biological resources. In the biological cycle, the strategy is to restore nutrients into the biosphere while building natural capital. So, for example, growing plants to feed humans and then any leftovers which can't be used could be sent for recycling via anaerobic digestion. And anaerobic digestion creates biogas to fuel homes and cars and fertilizer to grow new plants. So you're capturing that value all the way till its end of its end of life. The right side shows manufacturing side and the technical cycles. In these cycles, products, components and materials are kept in circulation in the economy for as long as possible. The most effective technical cycles involve maintaining and reusing products. This way, the value of the product is preserved and the use is length is increased. An example of this, and I think the easiest way to sort of explain it, would be that you as an individual are using a laptop. One way to extract more value from this item is by sharing it. So perhaps imagine that instead of paying to own this laptop which you have purchased, Instead, you rent it for the amount of time that is needed as on a monthly subscription. This way you pay for the experience of using the item rather than pay, paying to own the item. So instead of replacing the laptop, perhaps then when something is wrong with it, say a few keys break on the laptop, uh, the monthly subscription you pay for covers repairing of the item. So its value st stays in the circle for longer. Then perhaps when you actually don't need the laptop anymore, instead of placing it in the bin or in the cupboard so it's tucked out of the way and never used again, you have it redistributed to someone else so its value is retained for longer. Then perhaps in a few years, the laptop is taken for remanufacturing and refurbishing rather than sent for waste. So the screen might be reused and uh, sent on to be used for another laptop. But in this instance, the keyboard might be damaged. So instead, the keyboard is then sent to waste. But the waste isn't landfill or energy for waste. Instead, you're extracting as much of the material as possible from that. So you could uh, maybe take wires out and use the copper from those wires. So to sort of try and summarise this, essentially the circular economy is an economy where, as I mentioned before, nothing's wasted and assets, whether they're natural or whether they're man-made, maintain their value for as high as possible for as long as possible. The circular economy or, or, or living in a more circular uh, way would decrease the rate at which humans are extracting and using the Earth's resources. As I mentioned before, with mining, you know, we then wouldn't need to mine copper for as long. And as a result, decrease the impact which humans are having on the planet. So this is all very good in theory and it sounds lovely, but it can be quite hard to put into practice. So I wanted to show you an example of it already in action. And this is an example which actually I saw pop up on Dragon's Den uh, recently. So uh, some of you, if you've seen that, might, might have seen this example. This is um, it's called Little Loop Clothing and it tackles the issue of waste in children's clothing. So I'm sure even regardless of if you have children or not, you're probably aware that children grow very quickly and quite often their clothes have only been worn for maybe a, a few weeks uh, before they outgrow them. So with this service, a par parent pays for monthly subscription, like I was mentioning before, to rent children's clothes. So you pay a monthly fee and then you're given a certain number of credits each month. And then you, you use these credits to pay for clothes, which you rent until your child grows out of them or maybe no longer wants them or the season changes. You then return the clothes and are issued back credits to pay for other clothes. The number of credits an item costs depends on whether it's new, lightly worn or well worn. And this service prevents clothes from being used for short periods of time. So they might be used by one child for maybe three or four months and then they're put back into the system and used by another child for a few months. And this really helps maximise their value. So we're not just putting these clothes into landfill or maybe into the attic where you promise you're going to use them for a future child, but they just store there, stay there and gather dust. So, as I said at the beginning, I thought I would touch on some steps that you could take to maybe uh, live a more sustainable lifestyle. But I have to sort of caveat that with, you know, with that, that I don't have all the answers and people should be taking their own actions to live a more sustainable life. There are so many contributing factors which will affect everybody and every individual and what access you have to, re you know, maybe to resources or the, the, to take steps to live a more sustainable life. Whether that be financially where you are in life or where you live or even access that you have to information. So I've outlined some steps here and signposted a few broad considerations that you could take. But 
there's no hard and fast way about this. I would say it's whatever's within your reach. And, you know, a key factor, which is my final point, is it's really about education. So the first point is, as we sort of touched on today, about waste management and minimising waste. And that's what I do as a job day to day is helping people minimise waste. Um, but as an individual, you want to try and extract as much value from resources which you already have, whether this could be your phone. So your phone might, you know, you might your contract might only last two years. And after that, your phone then sits in a drawer and you buy a new one. And that phone's just sat there, you know, just gathering dust. So instead, why don't you continue using that phone or sell that phone onto somebody else who could use it? This also could be applied to even the simple things like food waste or leftovers in the fridge, uh, or even just refusing plastic bags. You know, refusing plastic bags can also then minimise that waste. So there are multitudes of easy ways to reduce waste, and uh, they can just start at home in your kitchen. I guess the next step would be looking at uh, considering second hand, whether you're looking for a new book to read, a new side table or maybe even a new coat. Why not consider browsing charity shops, Facebook Marketplace, eBay, antique shops, vintage shops? Not only are you likely to save money, but you're also, you know, you're prolonging the life of that resource, that item which is already in circulation. My third point is, if you can, you know, support renewable energy sources. So now, uh, and this is a hot topic, I'm sure, with uh, the price of electricity going through the roof and gas going through the roof. Um, you know, when searching electricity supplies, you can choose between those who are still using fossil fuels or those who are looking to move away from fossil fuels and are supporting wind farms and solar farms. So you could look to make that active change. A point um, which I am focusing on is supporting alternative farming methods. So rather than buying produce from traditional farming methods, uh, try and seek out alternatives. So I mentioned before about monoculture agriculture, and this is when you grow plants, for example, on the same bit of land and you just rotate that crop and you have that crop every time. Why don't you look at produce farmed with regenerative farming methods, which are a lot more sustainable and healthier for the planet? Or even look you know, to seek out local game options rather than looking at, you know, supermarket meat, which is farmed in uh, factories. Finally, you know, a key point, which I, I think sort of is, is probably should have been put as step number one now looking at it is, you know, is educate yourself. In this instance, you know, knowledge is power and this has never been truer than with understanding sustainability and how we can take positive steps to live a more sustainable lifestyle. There's so many companies out there trying to greenwash us by using the word sustainable and marketing and branding. I mean, just look at McDonald's when they change their logos from red to green. But I believe, you know, one of the most important steps you can take in living a more sustainable lifestyle is firstly educating yourself. This way you can really understand the impact which your particular lifestyle changes will make to the planet. I guess I wanted to summarise this part by sort of repeating what I heard uh, Sir David Attenborough say at a uh, dinner I was invited to prior to the pandemic and he was asked at the dinner what can we do to live a more sustainable life and everyone was sat there waiting for like the answer to be perfect and they'd run away home and follow that and he just said you know don't be wasteful don't waste food don't waste power and most importantly don't waste time uh, you know you summarize up by saying the time to act is now and I think that's really impactful and I think if you're going to listen to anybody it's probably going to be him so um, I thought I'd sort of definitely summarise with that when I said steps you could take. Talking about education, um, an area which, you know, as I mentioned before, I think is really key to this. Where can you find out more? So I think you've, if you're like me and you like documentaries and, you, and that's the way you like to learn, there are some really great ones out there. My favourite one, uh, which I've seen recently, is called Kiss the, uh, Kiss the Ground. And uh, Kiss the Ground, I think, is probably still available on Netflix. And this is a fantastic documentary which goes into the understanding of topsoil and agriculture and how this is basically key to life on Earth. Uh, another really interesting one which touches on uh, overfishing is uh, Seaspiracy. And if you like shorter bite sized snippets of information, I would definitely recommend sort of logging into YouTube and having a look at TED Talks which are out there. And if you just type in TED Talk Sustainability or TED Talk Circular Economy, there'll be hundreds which pop up um, and probably given by people with even more experience than I have in the industry. LinkedIn is a great resource and that's where you're likely to meet other like minded people. And you can also sort of browse other businesses and uh, companies on LinkedIn. So you can sort of see the steps which they're taking 
to become more sustainable and uh, to see if they're taking circular economy seriously in the work they're producing. If you're into books, um, there's some great resources out there again, and I, I suggest a great place to start would be looking at uh, the circular economy, a user's guide. And this was written by Walter, I think his name is Style, um, and he's perhaps regarded as probably one of the, the fathers of circular economy. And it's really not very long, uh, which is a bonus. It's quite a short book. And finally, I would sort of, you know, another area to look at would be websites. Ella MacArthur Foundation, as I mentioned before, they're sort of the four, they're sort of the front runners in circular economy, especially in the UK, and they have some great resources and they link to loads of interesting companies which are taking those steps. National Geographic, again, uh, normally have very up to date articles and they cover lots of areas from sort of ecology all the way through to waste. And finally, maybe consider looking at sort of the UN and the sustainable development goals. They have key goals which are outlined and these goals sort of go into uh, steps which should be taken to live a, to live a more sustainable lifestyle so we can uh, have a more sustainable planet. So I've probably whizzed through that in no time at all. Um, so at this point, I guess if anybody has any questions or if you're watching this and uh, not live, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn. So if you do have any questions, uh, that's my name there and you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Annalise, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for starting that without me. For some reason, um, I had no camera, but I'm here now. <laughs> and uh, had, had you know, really, I, I managed to catch all your talk. So thank you very much. So we have a few questions, um, as do I actually. So really, really informative. Um, so one, one question is, um, what is the IPCC? Ah, yes, the IPCC. So um, this is essentially, it stands for Intergovernmental Plan Pl Panel on Climate Change. And this was or is an intergovernmental body of the United Nations. And they're responsible for advancing knowledge on human induced climate change. And they re re uh, write reports and they have done since 1990s. And these are really long, very detailed reports showcasing the impact which humans are having on the planet. And they go into lots of different areas. Uh, they have um, they have just released their newest report. I think it was probably this month, if not the very end of February, where they released their newest report. And, you know, unfortunately, the results aren't great. They're sort of saying that we're going to start hitting, you know, reaching that sort of two, 2.5 degrees uh, temperature rise if we don't take action now. And, that you know, they have sort of summarised that basically said a lot of times we've been wasted probably by politicians uh, not putting in actions. But you can, the IPCC is basically here. Everyone goes to reference for, uh, key information that's being uh, gathered and released and they cover the whole of the world. They don't just sort of cover America and the UK. So I'd, I'd have a little Google about that, uh, them and their reports are really fascinating. Um, they, they sort of are the ones who politicians are often quote and are often told to sort of, you know, take these actions. Otherwise, we'll end up with, you know, the melting of the ice caps, flooding, you know, uh, wildfires and things. Fantastic. Thank you, Annalise. Um, and Etty, who asked the same question, actually says that she's got three sisters and they all wear the clothes that they have and then give them away. So that's great. That is great. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Charlotte. Um, so hello. Um, an ongoing debate in my climate change module is renewable energies. Mm. I would be interested to know if you believe we can come become 100 percent renewable uh, taking into account the uncertainties due to meteorological me me processes. Do I think we can become 100% reliant on them? Um, unfortunately, at the moment, it depends if you include nuclear in that. Um, nuclear is the only way that we're going to move away from fossil fuels at the moment. There is a lot of resource going into hydrogen and um, Another ex pupil, James Kerr, is very uh, well equipped to talk about that if you're interested. And I'm sure uh, he'll be very happy to hear any questions you have. But hydrogen is nuclear and hydrogen are the ways which are going to get us out of the fossil fuel industry at the moment. It's it appears. You know, it's not, you know, my strong area isn't isn't really to do with um, the use of fossil fuels and the moving to renewables. But from the research I have to undertaken, it would suggest that the only way in the next short term period of time that we're going to move away from fossil fuels would be including into renewables like wind and solar, uh, nuclear and hydrogen. 
And, you know, the UK, they are going about and putting in wind farms. You know, I live up in Scotland and I see wind farms going up all the time. Um, I just don't think that the subsidies are there yet. And there is the reliance on coal and uh, gas. And I think hopefully, if anything, that the situation we're in today um, with the prices of those rising and the constraints which we're having with Russia, it might help push us quick, more quickly to renewables. But I don't think that we will just be relying on, for example, solar and um, wind alone and sort of water and things anytime soon. Thanks, Annalise. I think, yeah, certainly you know, what's happening now is going to make us think twice about getting in a car mm. um, or t turning the lights off when we're not in the room. Mm. Uh, as, as I'm sure you'll agree, small small changes um, collectively make a big change. Definitely. Uh, yeah, um, we've got a question from Gary. Um, a brilliant presentation, Annalise. Uh, my question is, what are your views on renewable energy and what options offer the best potential for the future in the context of climate emergency and especially now with aid energy prices? Um, I guess I sort of maybe just answered that, but... I think you probably did actually. Yeah, I, but I, I, I'm not too sure yeah. what else to expand on. As I sort of said, unfortunately, my strong area isn't uh, renewables. Um, yeah. But yeah, probably, probably sort of what I mentioned before. I think, um, you know, okay. there is a lot of development in nuclear plants around the UK and nuclear it is... It is a little bit scary if you're not fully aware of all the benefits and all the cons to nuclear, but the UK government, uh, government at the moment are building nuclear plants like there's no tomorrow. So I suspect that's going to be um, a big focus, at least for the short term. Yeah. OK, we've got another long one. Are you concentrating? OK, go. <laughs> okay. Uh, what what would you imagine is going to be the best way to educate the, pub the public? Uh, he says, we looked at what impacts the consumer in agriculture to buy certain foods and eat in certain ways and found that influencers, both celebrity and industry professionals, had far more impact now than they did five years ago. However, only in the short term for most. So how would you foresee schools implementing education in this? And do you think replacing old topics is the way forward? That's a very interesting question. It is a very interesting question. Um... I can definitely see why influencers and you know even industry leaders have had an impact um, on people's behaviour change. Um, I guess in terms of education, I, I, I definitely think there should be going forward. I think I've perhaps also forgotten half the question already, but um, the you know going forward, I am a big believer that the only way we're going to get people to change is through education, and I think it should be from day one. And you know, even when I was at school, I think uh, 2005 to 2012, there was hardly anything mentioned about, you know, cli there were, climate change was touched on, but not really steps you could take. Or, you know, when they spoke about renewable energy, it was very broad and not a lot of detail. And I don't even ever really properly remember having, a, you know, classes on waste management or those, those sorts of areas. So I think the education system does need an up, you know, uh, like need a change. And I'm not too sure what the situation is in England, but I know in Scotland they are adding it into the curriculum quite early on. And there's big campaigns to get people into STEM, like uh, you know engineering and uh, science and maths, um, because they believe that the industry does need to change, and we do need to take steps to go you know go forward. And there's big recruitment drives in Scotland for this sector. Um, so I think. Education is a key is a key point, but I think you're right. The public don't make changes unless they're, I think, one educated on the topic. I think so many people out there just aren't aware of the impacts that certain things are having, um, and you know whether that's through influencers or whether that's through industry experts, whether it's even through like radio comms or, you know, just more signposting to it in the public public eye, having the press focus on it more. You know, I I, I recently found out about how the BBC have, I don't know exactly the word for it, but I guess they are, they sign contracts to basically say that they're not allowed to talk about anything outside of the current narrative. Well, that's fine if the current narrative is renewables, but what about all the other aspects that they could talk about? So I think, you know, the press, lots of people read the news, lots of people are aware of, um, you know, BBC and the, you know, even, even small news channels and things. I think that's a big education piece. But 
you're right, people, a lot of behaviour is only temporary and that's probably because it's not easy. Behaviour change is difficult. So we need to have implementations in place to make behaviour change easy. You know, to have supermarkets selling food which is produced by regenerative farming rather than just mass market, you know, chicken farms. Um, we need to have access to these and that's sort of what I was touching on when I said about you know, everyone's circumstance is different. What you have access to will be different, whether it's information or access to, you know, financially to these options. Um, I'm not sure there is one good solid answer, if I'm being honest, but that's that, that's my take on it. Yeah, I, mean, I think definitely education. I mean, I, I think, as, as you know, we have a fantastic eco committee um, and, uh, you know, we, we essentially I think we created, we collected at, um, uh, plastic bottles to make a Christmas tree and we had enough to, to make the Christmas tree uh, if, within two weeks so and actually we now have no single use uh, bottles at school we uh, or everyone has um, either obviously the, the plastic or all the actual metal ones so that's yeah. great. Yeah I think those steps which you know schools are now taking is is, is is really fantastic and having eco committees at a young age means that you're more likely to be involved as you get older you know even if you're not in this industry or in this field you know I, I have friends who work in finance but they have a green team within the finance team of the office they work in and they still uh, make changes within the office environment whether that's you know looking at temperature controls or you know radiators gas and electricity suppliers you know and they don't have to do this as a career it can just sort of be a side interest um, and I think starting at an early age is, is really key. Yeah, absolutely. And I also sometimes think that people don't believe that just turning the thermostat down a couple of degrees does make yeah. a difference. And yeah. it really does. To your bill. It does. Yeah. And you'll soon see it on your energy bills, I'm sure. So. <laughs> yeah, um, let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> OK, um, so Charlotte again. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'd, li I'd like to know what you think about nutritionally sustainable diets uh, to reduce agricultural processes. Uh, so do you think this is, is sustainable when considering the differing uh, ethnic tastes and resources? A question if I'm being honest. I think they're basically, um, yeah I mean I, I guess I guess she's talking about um, uh, sort of you know obviously you're, you're using things that you know less less meat so we're going you know not, yeah, not I vegan, think, but less meat so but people have different different tastes don't they and different ways yeah. of, so whether you've got sort of like Asian food or Japanese I suppose Japanese have a lot of raw, raw, raw food don't they? Yeah um, I don't quite understand your question, but I'm going to sort of interpret it in a way which okay. might answer your question. Um, I, I guess a common debate, and maybe this is what you're touching on, is sort of looking at um, plant based diets. Perhaps that's sort of where you're sort of touching on here. Um, and my take on plant based diets is I initially was under the impression that plant based you know, diets would be better for the planet and they would provide everybody with you know every, all the nutrition they needed um, and more recently I've sort of come to terms with the fact that that's not probably going to be the case um, we do need sort of regenerative agricultural practices where you're there's both animals and plants involved in that farming practice so I sort of touched on it in one of the slides where you sort of talking about a monoculture agriculture where you're sort of growing just plants and you're uh, using that sort of that land just for plants well you're then sort of whacking on fertilizer which yes in the short term which short term is about 100 years you're massively ramping up uh, production of the amount of potatoes that bit of land can grow but unfortunately you're really neglecting the topsoil so it means that after a 100 year cycle is over and where we are kind of now our soils are in such a poor condition that we can't harvest the same amount of crop um, looking a broad sort of more um, traditional farming in the sense of maybe what we would have seen pre-war you know their soils are healthier because they're farming and they're growing raising livestock on the land that they're growing crops on and there's this natural sort of cycle which is going on where you know cattle are maybe grazing on the grasses and their manure is then fertilizing the earth and there's this nice cohesive cycle um, that's definitely a focus whether that's you know in on land and sea that needs to there needs to be a shift towards because at the moment the current state of farming and diets is it's got to stop at some point there's, there's got to be a stop to it because we are using too many antibiotics in the current farming system and that could lead to an absolute disaster where we become you know resistant uh we, sorry we basically build up a yeah immunity to the antibiotics so we this 
farming that we're in now definitely needs to stop. Um, I I guess, you know, the, there have been studies to suggest that I know in the US there is enough land at the moment to have this sort of mixed farming approach like they would have had maybe like pre-war where they were farming and diets should be local. And I think this is maybe what you were touching on, perhaps, that we shouldn't be living where what we eat in Scotland is the same as what we eat in Venezuela because the climates are different. We shouldn't be having the same diets. You know, we should be looking at more local food sources. And so we should be looking at food which is produced within a short distance of where we live, not sort of importing avocados from Mexico in December in the UK like that. Just it's not great <laughs> um, for many different yeah. reasons. Yeah, she, she, yeah, so she talks about fertilizers production and transportation which is exactly what you touched on. So brilliant. Sure. I, I, I missed that rather quite important part of that question. So well done. <laughs> um, so actually someone's asked, um, so which clothing companies do you think are leading the way with sustainability? There's not a lot. Um, oh gosh, there's a really brilliant one up here that I used to go to a lot of conferences with. What's her name? She's a Scottish um, producer of outdoor clothing. It's all made for from Merino wool. And I want to say it's like, it's not Fidra, but it's something like that. I'll have to try and find the name. Um, and there are a few clothing companies out there who are selling more sustainable, you know, organically grown, materials but ultimately the most sustainable option is by renewing and uh is it sort of renewing clothes that you might already have so maybe making repairs uh in clothes that sh you know or changing up clothes that you already have and swap shops and second hand that is by far the most sustainable way there are lots of companies out there like the big brands who everybody even myself is guilty of buying from you know like the likes of h&m who they you know they might offer oh bring back your clothes and recycle them with us and um oh we're using um, only organically sourced cotton in 1% of our clothes, that this is unfortunately, uh, you know, greenwashing. Um, and there aren't many good brands out there. I'll try and find the name of that, Scot that Scottish company, uh, but that's more outdoor active wear, and that's all made um, in Scotland. I think when it comes to clothing and textiles, there's, there's quite a few issues that are going on, and it's not necessarily just to do with um, the, the use of materials, it's to do with uh, the labour as well and the labour being uh, abroad and people not being fairly paid and all of this comes into a cycle which has a knock-on impact so if you're then paying your workers uh, fair pay and uh, giving them better living conditions they can then perhaps live a more sustainable life because they have that extra income where they can then make choices themselves and this is what the UN sustainability development goal sort of touches on it's not just about you know use renewable energy and uh, you know, move away from maybe a, a heavy meat based diet. It's about all these knock on impacts that you can have, whether it's, you know, paying your you know workers more as well. So, um, yeah, I can't think of any brands, unfortunately, off the top of my head, but there are some out there. I think it's worth doing a good a good Google and a deep Google as well, because there's not the first ones which pop up won't always be the best ones. No, they just pay for the advertising. Exactly. <laughs> OK, uh, so Maggie, a uh, country farm recently showed a farmer, Neil Ridgway, who was converting a cow manure into le le electricity and emitting a, a significant amount of power. He also used PV panels on the sheep barn. Uh, in light of the higher electricity prices, should all farmers be actively encouraged by DEFRA to follow his lead? Um, perhaps, yes. Um, you can already with things like um, manure and abattoir waste and food waste. There are already, unfortunately not across the whole of England yet, but your food waste and where that goes, and that includes abattoir meat, uh, abattoir waste, and uh, and it can include manure and things as well. This is then sent to a process called anaerobic digestion. Uh, not all of it, some of it's sent to composting, um, but a large proportion sent to anaerobic digestion. And this process essentially extracts methane from the rotting waste and captures this and then this methane is then sold back to the grid to use to fuel homes and fuel cars and um, so this cycle is already going on at an industrial level and it is law in a lot of places now where if you're a, a business you have to be sending your waste there and that's why um, you know lots of sites do have food waste collections and you know more and more so we're having that with homes as well um, but at a, a local scale um, it's definitely better if you're producing it yourself um, 
if you're keeping that waste on land and then producing energy from that waste on land or producing compost from that waste on land, which is then, um, you know, adding to nutrients back into the soil, that's far better. If you just think about the transport um, distances that might have to be covered just by collecting that manure and sending it somewhere else, it could start to offset that the benefits. Um, so, you know, a long time, well, not a long time ago, but Recently, there were there were subsidies where you could um, get sort of solar panels and things from and get subsidies from the government. I think unfortunately they've scrapped those now, but I would definitely recommend you know looking at that if you're wanting to reduce energy, uh, you know, your price your energy bills and electricity. Thank you. And then talking of cars, actually, someone's asking, do you think electric cars are really the solution, given the reliance on such valuable metals? Yeah, that's a hot topic. And again, it's not one I'm probably um, equipped to talk in detail about. But, you, you know, there, there is a big debate out there whether or not electric cars are the way forward, um, mainly because of the mining of these raw materials. Now, if we can recycle these materials and reuse them and keep them in those value cycles, like I was showing with the um, Ella MacArthur diagram, then that's great. And there could definitely be a benefit there. The issue has been with particularly with the likes of Tesla, when they first released their electric cars, you couldn't get spare parts or online. There wasn't like a market for spare parts like there are for other cars. Um, so, you know, for, you know, my dad's a mechanic and if something broke on the car, he'd probably order a part and fix it himself or send it to the garage and get it fixed. So then you're not replacing that car. The issue was with the likes of these big uh, electric car firms is that there wasn't that as an option. And you had to take it back to the Tesla garage and it was very expensive and, you know, all these add-ons. Um, I think there are definitely benefits in electric cars, and I suspect that is where we will go. You know, there's already bans which are coming into place in the UK and, and and abroad, which are meaning that, you know, diesel cars are going to be cut down massively. They won't go to sell diesel cars, and that will eventually probably roll on to petrol cars as well. Um, the infrastructure needs to be in place, though, and at the moment there aren't enough, you know, like charging points. But it's the age old issue of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You know, you can't go putting in all these power points to charge cars without having the cars on the market to, you know, to be there to be charged. So um, I think if we can start understanding how we can better use the resources in these electric cars, whether it's the batteries, Im improving the battery performance as well as a key, as a key area I know that's under debate, then perhaps electric cars are the way forward uh, if you want to move away from diesel and, you know, petrol cars. But ultimately, the infrastructure should be in place for public transport. And that's something which the UK government at the moment is struggling with. Um, you know, we need to have better train connections. We need to have better bus links. We need to have better cycle paths so people can take these options. You know, at the moment, I live half an hour outside of Edinburgh and there's only two buses I can get in to the city. Now, those two buses are great for me. But if you live a, live a little bit further out, there's only one bus you can catch. So you've got to make sure you're on time to catch that bus. Then your option would be driving in. So if these, you know, if the infrastructure is in place of public transport, then um, you know, I think people would choose it. Um, so yeah, yeah then that's very true. I, I live very rurally, and we only have uh, one bus a day. So actually, you go yeah. out, you can't come back. Yeah, <laughs> it's like what's the point? I'm just going to yeah, stay exactly. in town all day. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone's asked a really great question about the circular economy. Um, so how can we promote a circular economy to our government and councils who seem yeah. to be missing the big picture? So what what can we do as individuals? Yeah, what can we do? That's that is that is the million dollar question when it comes to circular economy. I think I'm actually doing a project on the circular economy at the moment at work, and it's a topic which is like a buzzword at the moment. Everyone wants to be involved in it, but no one really knows what it means and no one really knows how to get there. Um, lobbying is a great way if you're interested in that side of things so supporting bills which are being pushed through parliament and that's through you know there's consultations which come out and you can as a member of the public or as a member of a business um, you can reply to these consultations and those consultations will help drive policy change at um that sort of government level other than that, it's by supporting businesses who are implementing a circular economy process. So this loop life clothing, which I sort of you know showed an example of, if instead of you going to, you know, a baby store, mamas and papas or whatever, and you're buying all these baby clothes for your child, maybe consider that. You're then supporting that business who can then grow and, you know, maybe have more advertising and get more customers. And then the businesses which aren't promoting a circular um, life or way of living will then essentially be taken out of the market. So that's the two ways I would sort of suggest is really by 
supporting businesses which are showing showing interest in circular economy and then if you're interested in it because i know it's you know a lengthy process sometimes is looking at lobbying and sort of consultations which are which are being produced by the government okay thank you yeah i mean that's just say lobbying and uh, you know your local councillor um uh you know your you don't I mean, you can actually start at ground roots level if you go to parish council meetings um you know having a voice there it's uh, there's lots of small ways i think we can make a difference mm. uh we have a question from tom so the government were talking about fracking uk shale on the radio this morning did you hear that um, annalise i didn't <laughs> i didn't hear okay. that one. right that's fine um so small modular reactors is the way forward for energy uh, renewables also have an impact with regards to mining the rare earth metals. So do you think the government are acting fast enough and supporting developing nations? Um, no, is probably my answer. They're not acting fast enough. Um, I, if I'm being honest, my, my knowledge of fracking industry is, is, is quite limited. Um, and talking about modular um, aspects, I guess, <laughs> I okay. guess just my answer my answer is probably just no they're not acting fast enough and developing yeah. nations is definitely an area we need to focus on because you know they the issue is one of the key issues is I guess is we've already had our industrial revolution we had our industrial revolution and we used coal to get us through that and that has given us all the technology and the infrastructure that we have today in Britain and it's lovely and for a lot of people it's a very cushy way of living not for everybody by any means um but other countries yet haven't had that opportunity to get to that point. And now they're now relying on coal and they're like, well, you know, that their argument is really, well, you had this opportunity to burn all this coal to get to where you are today. Now give us this opportunity. Um, and if I'm being honest, I don't know enough about this area, but what I do know is there's not enough being done to help these developing nations to move away from uh, traditional fossil fuels. And there's carbon credits out there in all of this, but whether or not it's the right uh, way to go is uh, definitely debated a lot and I would probably not agree with them but um, so that's my take on that I'm not sure it really okay. answers your question. <laughs> okay um, James has got interesting one maybe it's something for you actually so there's a great book he says called How Bad Are Bananas by Mike Berners-Lee which explains and compares the carbon footprint of loads of things we consume it's a very enlightening read. I haven't read it but I do know about it and I have um I have heard it quoted a lot and yeah oh, good. it does okay. it does compare a lot of things I haven't read it yet but I will put that on my reading list um because I have heard it's very good um yeah and Brilliant. yeah yeah I've just got a couple a couple more questions before we finish so um at present sustainability comes at a cost in that locally produced food is more expensive yeah environmentally friendly clothing is more expensive <laughs> sustainable energy is high, a higher price yeah. How soon do you think that sustainability will become affordable for everyone and not just for the higher income households? That's a very yeah. interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, it's very true. And this is, you know, this is one of the big issues is that it does cost more. And I think that those who are in a fortunate, uh, uh, the more fortunate situations where they can afford to look at these more sustainable options should be. Um, on the basis that they're doing it not just for themselves but for everybody else and if they start buying into those markets the market price will drop the issue really is about government subsidies and it's it's something which they like to sort of maybe not mention but you know farmers are given subsidies um the oil and gas industry are given millions and millions of pounds in subsidies every year and without these subsidies it would probably be the same price if not more than sustainable um and sort of local options so again, that's looking at sort of lobbying and getting that out of the way so we can actually then have a, a level playing field for these farmers who are maybe local or for these local suppliers. Um, and sort of, as I sort of just touched on before, you know, if you if you are, are in a fortunate position where you can afford to buy locally, the more people buy locally, the lower the prices will be for others. So then it gives access to, to, to more people. Um, it's not the ideal answer and I think as, once government subsidies are out of the equation there will be a more level playing field but until that's at a point we're still going to be in the situation where things are going to cost more unfortunately. Yeah yeah I mean sometimes you know you go to the supermarket and you find a chicken is like three or four pounds I mean how anybody can breed yeah. a chicken for three or four pounds just you know. Yeah it's so true I, I was like recently in a supermarket 
And I was like, oh, I just wonder how much their like free range organic chicken breasts are. No exaggeration, two free range organic chicken, chicken breasts were 25 pounds. Oh and I was God. like, who can afford to, like some people can afford to pay that for two, two chicken breasts. But if you're a mum feeding a family, you know, and that is several days worth of meals, not just like just two chicken breasts. Like I just, that it is a big issue and it needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Right. We've got one more reading for your reading list. Okay. Which is um, Ollie. It's the National Food Strategy. The plan 2021 is a very worthwhile read, especially chapter four on junk food. Yes, I think I have. I don't think I've read all of it from being honest, but I definitely have referenced that before. So I'm sure I've sort of touched in and out of it, but I will I will add it to my reading list. Um, yeah, definitely. Good. And then just the last a last comment actually from Charlotte. So um, hi, Annalise. Brilliant presentation. Very insightful. Um, I have so many more questions. What is the best way to contact you? Um, LinkedIn. So if you catch me on LinkedIn, that's my name on LinkedIn as well. So um, just add me there and then you can just fire away any questions you have. Um, I may end up putting on to people who are, can answer them better. Um, but I think I think LinkedIn's a great resource. and I think it's really underused, especially at a younger age. You know, even my siblings are like, I don't want to get LinkedIn. Like, what am I going to put on there that I've had like two small jobs? It doesn't matter. Like, it really doesn't matter if you just put, I'd always put a picture and just put your name and, you know, where you went to school or you know what your interests are or uh, you can just start connecting with businesses and following businesses that you're interested in and following uh recent you know guidance which is coming out and follow, following people who are like-minded as well and it can definitely help you with contacts and industry so if you wanted to to you know follow what i do in my industry or what mm. others do in their industry you can sort of see the career path they've taken and businesses they might have been employed at an earlier stage in their career yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, we, we, we do do um, LinkedIn workshops for year 13 here. So yeah. uh, we try and get people connected as soon as possible. Right. Well, thank you so much, Annalise. It's been really, really fascinating and I, I hope very enlightening for people. Uh, and hopefully we'll all be trying to live a slightly more sustainable life. I certainly will be. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, so if you want to get, ask for any more questions, get in contact via LinkedIn. And uh, we hope to have another lecture in the summer term. So good night, everyone.